much better. We're glad that we can all be here together this morning. Uh, those of you who've been here in recent weeks know that we've been studying the letter of 1 Peter. And, uh, but for the next uh, few Sundays, I want us to take a break <clears throat> from 1 Peter and uh, think about the family of Jesus. We, we don't usually talk much about Jesus' family for some reason. Uh, but I do want us to uh, spend some time the next few Sundays thinking about them. I want us to, today to talk about Jesus' brothers and sisters, and next Sunday about his mother Mary, and then uh, the Sunday after that, Christmas Day, to think together about his earthly father, Joseph. But today, his brothers and sisters. Now, it comes as a surprise to a lot of folks to learn that Jesus had brothers and sisters. We've either just never thought about it, or they've been told that he didn't have brothers and sisters. When we think about Jesus' family, though, I think most of the time we think about three people, don't we? We think about Mary and Joseph and Jesus, particularly uh, as a baby, because that's when we see the, the family uh, all together. But the fact is, Scripture indicates that Jesus' family was quite large. In fact, he was one of at least seven children, uh, and maybe more, I think probably more than that. So this was a good-sized family, but it was not uncommon uh, to have family that size in, uh, in Jesus' time. We know that he had four brothers, both Matthew and Mark tell us that, and they give us their names, James and Joseph and Judas and Simon. You find those in Mark 13, uh, Matthew 13 and in Mark chapter 6. All the context of this in which uh, his brothers are named uh, is the skepticism of the people of Nazareth when he goes to his hometown. He's been teaching all these parables uh, and giving all of this great wisdom, and the people in his hometown take offense at this. And they begin to say to one another things like this, we, we know him, uh, we, we know him, he's one of us. We know his parents, we know his brothers and his sisters are here uh, with us. Where does, who does he think he is and who does he think he's, where does he think he's getting all of this great wisdom? So in Matthew chapter 13, verse 56, after naming the four brothers, it also says, and are not all his sisters here with us. And that's where we find out that Jesus had sisters as well. Now, notice the wording, all his sisters. Now, Mark just says, are not his sisters here with us. Matthew says, are not all his sisters here with us. That would indicate perhaps more than two sisters. If there were four brothers, Jesus, and two sisters, that's seven kids. But all would indicate perhaps more. So there may have been somewhere between seven and ten children in the household in which Jesus grew up, or even perhaps more. Uh, we hope, <clears throat> for the sake of Mary and Joseph, that there were not more. But, <clears throat> but we don't know. Uh, but we know that there were at least <clears throat> seven. Now, we don't know anything at all about his sisters. Uh, we're not given their names. Uh, nothing is said about that. But we do know quite a bit about his brothers, particularly about his brother James. There's a passage in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 19 where Paul refers to James, the Lord's brother, as one of the leaders of the church in Jerusalem. Paul said, I had gone to Jerusalem and I didn't meet with the apostles, but I did meet with Peter and with James, the Lord's brother. So we know that he was uh, prominent in the early church and a leader in the church in Jerusalem. You see that reflected also in Acts 15, where James is the spokesman for the group as they discuss the, the major issue facing them at that time, whether or not the Gentiles had to follow the law of Moses in order to be acceptable uh, in the, uh, the body of Christ. And James was uh, kind of taking the lead uh, in that, uh, that meeting. Uh, we also have good reason to believe that James was the author of the New Testament letter of James. Although he doesn't say James, the brother of Jesus, he says James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. But there's plenty of reasons to think that uh, he probably was the uh, author of that letter. The first century historian, Jewish historian Josephus, says that Jesus had a brother named James. And he said that he was very pious. He was noted for his piety but that he was stoned to death uh, by a Jewish mob uh, who had uh, become angered at the Christian movement. And Josephus, not a Christian, but himself a Jew, uh, lamented this. He said this was a, a very great tragedy because James was a good man. He was a godly man. 
and that he was well known as being devout and faithful. Now, Jude, or Judas, uh, also perhaps was the author of a letter in the New Testament, letter of Jude, but he simply describes himself as a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. But there, are, again, is good reason to believe that this is Judas or Jude, the brother of Jesus. Now, some folks deny that Jesus had any brothers or that he had any sisters. And uh, we need to try to understand why uh, that is the case. Early in the church's history, in fact, in the, the very late second century, it's the first time it ever appears, uh, but there arose this belief in what's called the perpetual virginity of Mary. And that simply means the belief that Mary gave birth to Jesus as a virgin and that she remained a virgin all her life, that she never gave birth to any other children. The scripture says nothing like that, nothing about that, uh, but this was a part of a, a veneration of Mary that was growing among some in the early church, and they even began to pray to her and uh, to create various legends about her that uh, have no bearing at all in scripture. And uh, So this belief in her perpetual virginity was part of that, and so if she was perpetually a virgin, then Jesus could not have had brothers and sisters. Well, and yet the scripture says that uh, he did have brothers and sisters, so how do people deal with that? Well, there are two claims made about that sometimes, and they're both false. One of them is, is that this word brothers actually means cousins. And so if you look at uh, Roman Catholic Bibles, for example, it will talk about Jesus' cousins rather than his brothers. That's just simply not true. There's a good Greek word for cousin, and it does not occur uh, in those texts, but the word for brothers and sisters uh, does. But another theory that has been put forth is that the uh, brothers and sisters of Jesus were half-brothers and sisters, that Joseph had had a previous marriage, that he was a widower when he married Mary, and he already had these children uh, that the Bible talks about, and so Mary never gave birth to any children other than Jesus. There's absolutely no historical evidence to any of that, that Joseph was a widower, that he had been previously married, that he had children. What the Bible says is that Jesus had brothers and sisters, and we ought to be content with that. But that raises a question, doesn't it? If he had brothers and sisters, why isn't there more said about them in Scripture? Uh, why do uh, James and Jude, for example, when they write their letters, simply refer to themselves as servants of the Lord Jesus Christ and not as brothers of the Lord Jesus Christ? Wouldn't that have made their letters have more impact? Wouldn't that have made them stand out a bit more if, they, uh, if people knew that they had been written by the actual physical brothers of Jesus? Well, we can't be certain why there isn't more said about them. But I think it probably has to do with the events that are recorded in Mark chapter 3 and verse 21. There's a very unfortunate event that takes place there. Jesus has been gaining uh, notoriety because of his miracles and because of the great wisdom of his teaching and his parables and all these other things. And his family shows up. Mark chapter 3 and verse 21 says his family heard about all of this and they went out to seize him. They went out to seize him because they were saying he's out of his mind. Literally, the Greek says he's beside himself. He's out of his mind. So at this point, they believed that he was mentally unstable, and they needed to go take charge of him. And you'll see various translations translate that different ways. One will say take charge, one will say seize, so forth. But they, they feel that they've just got to go get him and get him under control, probably take him home, and uh, try to keep him there and keep, try to keep him quiet uh, rather than going around Galilee and saying these things that they don't think are correct. But later in that same chapter, after Mark says that his family thought he was out of his mind, Jesus is in Capernaum, and he's seated in a house, and there's a large crowd of people gathered around him, and his mother and his brothers try to gain entry to that house. They try to get access to Jesus. They can't do it because of the crowd. So a messenger comes in and says to Jesus, your mother and your brothers are outside and they want to see you. 
Now, I suppose that the messenger thought that probably Jesus would say, well, some of you folks need to kind of move aside and, or move out and let my mom and my brothers come on, come on in because, after all, they're my physical family. But he didn't do anything of that sort. Instead, he asked a question. He said, who are my mother and my brothers? And he looked around at those seated nearest him his disciples, and he said, these are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God, it's my mother and my brother and my sister. My guess is that the brothers, particularly the brothers of Jesus, had a hard time ever forgetting that. They probably had a hard time living that down. They learned the hard lesson that there's a lot more to being related to Jesus than simply physical relationship and that that physical relationship really doesn't mean a lot unless you are, in fact, a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's how James and Jude wanted to describe themselves, servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. It really didn't matter that they were related to him physically. That did not gain them any access to anything. That didn't get them any closer to him. That didn't get them any closer to God. But being his servant, following him, did. There's also the fact that's already come up that during his earthly life and prior to the cross and the resurrection that they simply didn't believe in him. That's why they thought he was out of his mind. They didn't, it didn't occur to them that what he was saying was true. They didn't occur to, him, to them that uh, he was there proclaiming the kingdom of God. So in Mark 3, we're told that they thought he was out of his mind, but in John chapter 7 and verse 5, it's explicitly said that Jesus' brothers did not believe in him. It was time for the, uh, the feast, the great, uh, the great feast, and the brothers were going to go up to Jerusalem for that feast, and they said to Jesus, why don't you go up and reveal yourself. Why don't you go up and show people who you are? Apparently, they were getting a little bit testy, a little bit uh, tired of hearing about Jesus. And they said, why don't you just go prove it? There'll be a big crowd in Jerusalem for this feast. So why don't you go do something there and prove who you are? And John adds the comment that they did not believe in him. So probably later on, they did not feel it appropriate to claim kinship to him on a physical level. After all, that was irrelevant compared to being his disciple. But then a big shift occurs. You look at Acts chapter 1 and verse 14, and it tells us something very important, very interesting. It says that when the uh, 11 apostles following Jesus' crucifixion and after he had risen uh, from the dead and then risen back into heaven, they're gathered in Jerusalem in an upper room, and with them are Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Jesus' brothers. And the last time we've heard from them, they were not believers. But here they are now gathered with the 11 apostles, awaiting the appointment of the 12 of Matthias, awaiting the coming of the Spirit on the day of Pentecost, and they're there along with the apostles, and uh, his brothers are there uh, along with their uh, mother. Well, that makes us wonder, doesn't it? What happened? How did that come about? I think the answer is found in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 7. Because Paul, in talking about the resurrection appearances of Jesus, his appearances to various people after he rose from the dead, said that he appeared to James and then to all the apostles. And the fact that he separates James from the apostles suggests that, that's, that James is not either of the two apostles named James, but it's Jesus' brother. He appeared to James, his brother, and he appeared to all the apostles. And then later Paul says, last of all, he appeared also to me. But apparently Jesus appeared to his brother, James, and then James apparently told the other brothers, fellas, we've been wrong about this. We had him wrong all along. And they became believers, and so they were gathered there with them in that upper room awaiting the day of Pentecost. So there was an amazing transformation that took place. Well, okay, that's uh, good history, but why is it important? 
What difference does it make to know that Jesus had brothers and sisters? Well, one thing is, it shows us that the story of our Savior is not a myth. It's not a myth. The story of Jesus is not a story. Once upon a time, there was a man named Jesus in a land somewhere far, far away. In fact, the Bible tells us about a man named Jesus who lived in a specific place on this planet at a specific period in time, and he had a, he had a rather ordinary family life. He was born into a rather ordinary family. Uh, he was an actual person, he was a real person, and he had a real family. You see, only Matthew and Luke tell us anything at all about his birth, and then we have a, a gap from the time of his birth until he's about age 30, according to Luke 3.23, when we know of only one episode in his life, and that's when he was 12 years old, and, and he got separated from his parents in Jerusalem, and they found him in the temple. So you've got that whole span there from his, from his infancy to his adulthood when he's about 30, and we don't know anything at all about him. And that's really interesting to us, isn't it? Because it makes us wonder, what was going on then? What was he like? And, and why don't we have anything about it? Why didn't the Bible tell us about it? I suspect the reason that the Bible doesn't tell us anything about it is that he was living the life of, of an ordinary young Palestinian man. There wasn't anything really exceptional going on except that he was living a sinless life. But other than that, he was not out proclaiming the kingdom of God, not yet. Uh, he was not doing the miraculous things that he would do later. He was doing what Luke chapter 2 says that he did. He went home with Mary and Joseph when he was 12 years old, and he was submissive to them, and he grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. But other than that, his life was pretty much the life of an ordinary Palestinian young man. You see, all of this is part of the mystery of God and part of the mystery of Christ that we celebrate at this time of year as well as at other times of the, of the year. And that mystery is that Jesus, the Word, who is also God, became flesh and dwelled among us. The Word became flesh and dwelled among us. We can try and try to wrap our minds around that, but we really can't. What we can do is believe it. We really can't understand it. We really can't grasp it. How can deity be confined in human body? And yet Paul says in Colossians that all the fullness of deity dwelt bodily in Jesus. I don't know how that's possible, but I believe it. I can't analyze it. I can't explain it, but I can believe it, and I can proclaim it. It's part of that great mystery of God. What happens sometimes is that we get so focused on the deity of Jesus that we really don't do justice to his humanity. We really don't think of him as a man. We really don't think of him as having a body of flesh and blood like our own. We don't think of him as being able to get tired and to be hungry and thirsty. I've even had people tell me that when Jesus died on the cross, it didn't hurt because he was God. And I thought, what Bible are you reading? Because Jesus was a man. And the nails hurt his flesh just like they would mine or they would yours. And this, this business of him being a part of, a, of an actual family is a part of that story. That he was born into this world and he lived and he suffered and died as a human being, yet as a human being who is also God. He's not a mythological Savior. He is a real flesh and blood, God in the flesh Savior who lived and died as a man. And his family is part of that story. And his family reminds us of his humanity. But there's even more importance than that. The story about Jesus' brothers and sisters reminds us about the power of unbelief. Power of unbelief. Here, Jesus' brothers grew up with him. And the Bible says that he never committed a sin. Now, I want you to think about this, especially about your younger siblings. <laughs> How many of you have sinless younger siblings? Okay, right. I didn't have any younger siblings until I was 14 years old, and, and I, thought, I thought my baby sister then could do no wrong, so... That wasn't a problem, but, but, you know, my older sister, I knew she had a lot of 
stuff going on. <laughs> and, and she probably thought I did too, although she was in error. Um, but, you know, you think about the relationships between siblings and, and the fact of one being sinless had to stand out to those guys. I mean, it had to say something to them. It had to be obvious to them that our brother is no ordinary man, but somehow, somehow they still didn't quite believe it. it here they come in Mark 3 to take charge of him, to seize him because they think he's out of his mind, but Mary is with them. And it was to Mary that the angel had made that great announcement that Steve read for us earlier. It was to Mary that the angel had said, you're going to conceive and, and that child to be born of you will be called the son of the most high. But somewhere along the line, something happened and we wonder what happened? How could that how could that possibly be? Is this contradictory? And the answer is no, it's not contradictory. It's just telling us that Mary was human. She was human. She heard what the angel said. She believed what the angel said. But over a 30-year period of time, when everybody had thought that she had, had given birth to a child out of wedlock, over that 30-year period of time, she's been waiting for him to somehow manifest himself, and he hasn't done it yet. And when he begins all this talk about the kingdom of God and telling all these parables and people begin proclaiming him possibly to be the Messiah, she thinks this is too much. She was human. Same thing happens to John the Baptist. It was John the Baptist who heard the voice of God say, this is my beloved son. And yet later it was that same John the Baptist who when he was in prison in danger of having, having his head cut off, sent messengers to Jesus to ask him, are you the one who is to come or should we look for somebody else? In other words, if you're going to do something, please do it now. He was human. All the people that we're talking about here were human beings. They were wondering what was going on. Same thing was true with Jesus' brothers and his sisters. But let me tell you what the real question is. It's not what did his brothers and his sisters think about him. It's what do you and I think about him? What do we believe about him? After all this time with all the testimony that we have of scripture, what do we believe about him and how consistently do we live out that faith? Do not let unbelief creep in and turn your heart away from Jesus. Do not let unbelief steer you away. There's plenty of it out there. But don't let it turn you away from trusting in the one who is, in fact, the son of the most high. There's one other thing of importance about Jesus having brothers and sisters. That has to do with the power of his resurrection. The power of Jesus' resurrection. All those years, uh, James and the others lived in unbelief about their brother's identity but that changed in a moment when he appeared to them after rising from the dead. They knew he was dead. Mary had saw him die. Uh, John, the apostle of Jesus, had been present with her at the cross. And Jesus said, woman, behold your son, behold your mother. They knew all that. And yet he appeared alive. And when he appeared alive to James, that changed everything. And James apparently told the others, and the power of Jesus' resurrection turned everything around. You remember Paul's statement in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that the gospel consists of the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus. And we usually stop it right there, but that's not what Paul says. He said the gospel consists of the death, burial, resurrection, and his appearances after the resurrection. We cannot leave those out of the picture. Because it's the fact that he rose from the dead and he appeared alive. That's what persuaded people, that he was risen from the dead. Th those appearances validate the claim of who he is and validate the claim of his resurrection. And so he appears then to James and then to all the apostles, and that's what converted them. And eventually that's what converted Paul. Because he says, last of all, he appeared also to me. And I'm unfit to be called an apostle. But he appeared to me, and Paul became a believer. Now, let me assure you of something. I don't believe the risen Christ is going to appear personally to you. Some people 
say that he has to them. That's between them and, and God. But I'm not convinced that he's in the business of appearing personally to people today. But he has already appeared to many that Paul lists in 1 Corinthians 15. And we have their testimony preserved for us in Scripture. They are the eyewitnesses. And we are called upon to be believers based upon that eyewitness testimony. We're called to be believers. And to believe, believe that testimony be changed by the power of Jesus' resurrection from the dead. In 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21, which we have not got yet gotten to in our study of 1 Peter, Peter is talking about the power of the flood that took place in the days of Noah and how through water God delivered Noah and his family, those eight persons. And he makes this statement. He says, baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a clear conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So today, when anyone is baptized into Christ, believing in him and trusting in him to be who Scripture says that he is, they are appealing to God for a clear conscience through his resurrection, through the power of that resurrection. So here's the question today. Do you want a good conscience where God is concerned? Do you want to know where you stand with God? Do you want to know where you're going to be in eternity? Do you want to know what's going to happen to you when this life is over? You can have that clear conscience when you appeal to God for it through the resurrection of Jesus by being baptized into his death and being raised with him in newness of life. That's what puts us into Christ, and that is what helps us, causes us to be redeemed from sin and to have eternal life. And then, this Jesus who had brothers and sisters in the flesh will count you as one of his brothers and sisters in the spirit. Because what did he say? When his mother and his brothers were trying to get to him through that crowd, he looked around at his disciples and he says, whoever does the will of God is my mother and my sister and my brother. You have the opportunity today to be counted among the brothers and the sisters of the Lord Jesus Christ by his mercy and his grace and the power of his resurrection. What a great time to confess your faith in him. What a great time to come and say, I want to be united with Christ. I want my sins forgiven. I want that good conscience, and I'm appealing to it as I'm baptized today in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. If you're ready today to receive that great blessing, come and tell us, and we will help you as we stand together and sing. Wonderful story of love.